just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you took that as an insult. If you mean true for you is different from true for anybody else. Have yeah, it absolutely, to because I can't Something prove either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. It is that time again. Welcome to O'Reilly Radio, show 126A, recorded Friday, September 16th, 2016, where we are going to dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations. It'll make you go, really. I'm your Stan DeCowan, and I have my usual suspect, Daniel Atherton, joining me. It's a smaller Hello. panel, smaller panel this evening, but we also have a wonderful recurrent guest in our chat room, and that would be Mama Van. So thank you, Mama Van, for joining us. And uh, obviously your critique is going to be vitally important as we carry on through this malaise that the world has presented to us. How you doing, Daniel? Doing pretty well. There's a lot to unpack here. Yeah, there is. Um, I think we're probably going to be doing most of the unpacking in the show, in the B. So this is the A side. So... Uh, it's going to be a little bit lighter, more history and things like that, just to give you a little tease. Um, and we brought back a logical fallacy. I found yet another website that has different logical fallacies. Uh, so we'll see if that's any better or worse or what have you. But here we go. So, uh, audience feedback. I did not get anything from the last shows other than my own critiques that the audio was crap. So, um... I'm trying to make that better. I have some crazy ideas for things that will make the show uh, continuously improving, uh, including trying to get around the Skype issues and the Hangouts issues and the Echoes and the weird things, because as they change things, we are at their mercy, since we're not making enough money to actually pay for a giant thing that will make it all nice and, and neat. And by giant things, I'm, I'm talking, they want to charge like thousands of dollars a month for video conferencing. So it's like, no, 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 no. That's not gonna, I'm not even making $1,000 a year. So, <laughs> in fact, I'm probably spending way more than that. Uh, and if, if I have to go through this, that's kind of what I'm going to do too. So um, I got a crazy idea, you know, for those of you that are of that mindset, I got a crazy idea to get a surveillance camera uh, system from... Alibaba out in, in China. Uh, it's only like 150 bucks for an eight channel video recorder. So it's a security DVR. You know, pretty high res. Uh, not that it's really that important for having little postage stamp people in the corner. And that will take inputs from just a standard, you know, TV or, or video camera, like security camera stuff, real chintzy stuff. And then I was going to get a bunch of Raspberry Pis. And I was going to get the Raspberry Pis to run Linux, and then I was going to call out with those on individual programs, whatever happened to be working that day, and send that feed into that. And then I would send that feed into a nice HDMI video capture device. Hopefully it'll work. And, uh, and then I would cut it up from there. Maybe that'll work. Maybe it won't. I don't know. I'm kind of patterning this off of uh, what uh, twit.tv the uh, Twit Broadcasting Network, what they have done in the past for many, many years. They call it the Skyposaurus, and I will as well. But I'm doing it much less expensive than what they're doing, because they've got this big, like, $15,000 TriCaster broadcast board that takes HDMI inputs from all over. I mean, they they got a TV studio. So I'm doing whatever I can in my office. So here we go. So fun stuff, but that's... These are the things that roll around in my head as I'm driving around, like, how can I make the show better? How can I hack my way through this and make it work uh, without actually putting so much more work on myself? I'm, I'm going to need an intern. I'm going to need somebody to probably drive some of this for me, but, uh, you know, <laughs> that'll, you know, uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it goes, but uh, right now, this is the way it is, so we just got us, so we'll just enjoy the show. So if you have anything to add to the show, any ideas for maybe my Skyposaurus project or anything like that, uh, go ahead and sh shoot us an email, oreallyradiopodcast at gmail.com, or phone it in uh, just real quick at 470-222-6759. It'll just be a voicemail. If it's something for the show, we'll go ahead and play it. Uh, we'll also take text, take the text messages, SMS stuff, right at, those, uh, at that address as well. So, <clears throat> all right. 
if we make mistakes also, you know, go ahead and correct us. That's kind of the thing that we really want out of that whole thing because we, we are a self-correcting medium. Everybody needs to call us on our shenanigans and, uh, and make, set us right with the world. So into uh, potpourri, whatever happens to be out there. These are just quick bites. I don't really want to get into them too much, but if it's so interesting, we will. Uh, NASA analysis finds that August 2016 is yet another record month in a series of record months. They've got a nice little graphic here that I'll show you, and that's, that's it. If, you're, if you are capable, you should always watch us in the YouTube uh, post facto, or if you're really, really cool, like Mama Van, you can watch us in the Twitch stream directly from our website at oreallyradio.com. Um, so the uh, the infographic here, it's just a nice little chart. It's of, a rainbow chart. It is a rainbow chart where the cooler temperatures and the warmer temperatures, you know, it goes from blue to red. Uh, from 1880, that's the bottom, the lowest of the low temperatures, and uh, 2016 is, is quite high up there. Now, it looks like it's a big, significant change. And this is the, the yearly anomalous temperatures, you know, going through the whole year. So, yeah, it gets warmer, it gets colder, you know, through the seasons as we, ha- as we know them. Uh, but this summer, yeah, August is way above, though. It's way above all the other lines where they just kind of drift in and out. 2016, is, it's also the warmest everywhere it might have matched in uh june yeah yeah it looks like that that match it's really close really close right there to uh the 2000 numbers uh but o- not close. over here this this uh this chart here that's at zero degrees you know normal and that's a two degree change that's not good yeah, two degrees centigrade uh, over and over and over. Well, we've been able to chart ice ages uh, from things like that and the lack of ice and it all melting. So, yeah, it, it causes some problems. Okay, uh, also the um, uh, XKCD did an excellent, excellent timeline of those numbers. Uh I suppose I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll put that in the show notes as well. But you can find this in the show notes available out at the website um, where you found, probably found the podcast. So for 126A. Also, uh, new evidence is forcing scientists to reconsider how the moon was formed. Ooh. I have not looked at this too much, but uh, I'm apparently, at least according to Science Alert, uh, things just got complicated. Mm. Uh <laughs> So there's chemical evidence suggesting that uh, things are were more violent than we'd assumed. Um, we assumed fairly violent. Yeah, and yeah, we always considered that it was pretty violent, but they're suggesting that the impact that set our moon free was like a sledgehammer hitting a watermelon. Uh, so I wonder how big this planetoid was before. And where did everything else go? Well, if we actually had a larger ejection event, yeah, that's that's significant. Yeah, um, and could possibly explain again. Debris can just you know disperse if it's a significant enough event, and we have our asteroid belt and the Oort cloud. Mm-hmm. So there's there's stuff that we could possibly find out there that's actually from here, ancient here. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is the hypothesis is, is known as the giant impact, and there's an article out at the BBC uh, with that. So, if you follow the follow the rabbit trails, you're going to get some really interesting stuff about how the Earth was formed. And I will look at this later, but to do an in depth on that, uh, well, now's not the time. Also, in uh, the employer of. The shooter that shall not be named on this program, the Pulse nightclub killer, uh, they have been fined. The employer has been fined one hundred and fifty-one thousand four hundred dollars. An interesting, an interesting number, I must say. It's probably the limit of what they're allowed to do by law for some yeah. strange reason. Uh, for filing false psychological forms on uh, the guy that did the shooting. So. Could this have all been prevented? Well, it's conjecture, isn't it? 
but uh, it definitely it smells really bad. So hopefully that uh, maybe there's there's going to be some impetus for employers to I don't know not falsify f- forms. That'd be that'd be a great idea, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be great. But again, until laws are chained to actually, you know, take a bite. This is a drop in the bucket. It is a drop in the bucket. I can't argue that point. I mean, it's true. So, though, I will say that small business, they're not going to, um, uh, they're not going to enjoy that kind of fine. That's not a small business. No, it isn't. It needs to scale yeah. up based upon the holdings and the value, average income. The valuation yep. of the company. Yeah. It needs to be on a sliding scale instead of a set scale. Yeah. yeah it does. Because otherwise it just becomes, as we've talked about with um, you know, the, the various uh, statements through history of you know, fines happening because people died. You know, having four thousand pounds of steel fall on them and things like that. Um, yeah, the, the fines are minuscule in comparison to the amount of money that it would take to actually resolve the problem. Uh, so they don't, and then it ends up just being a cost of doing business. In it's, this particular case, however, it's a form that they didn't fill out right, and they could have just hired another guy. Well, with with this, this brings me to something that. If you're looking at the U site uh, in some of their posts, the uh, concept of restorative justice. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to make it so that those that did the wrong are forced to confront the fact that they were wrong and then move forward to try and. You're the wrong bre- that they did. You're breaking up really bad. Uh, of course I am. Yeah. So just say say that again. What you just said. Restorative justice. Yes. It is making the the individual or corporation that is guilty understand what they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, them actually try and move sincerely forward, and a a form of restitution to the victims. Be make that happen. Um, it's something yeah. that is done more often, especially in Norwegian countries, uh, and in Sweden, Finland. It's it's their concept of justice. Um, well, they but also, we don't do that here. They also have a concept of rehabilitation too. Yeah, which but is something. restorative justice. Yeah. This person. We want them to come back into society. We want them to understand what they did wrong and not repeat it. Yeah, we don't want to we, shun we, them. We, no, they're still a member of our society. They're supposed to come back. Do you want them to come back rehabilitated or do you want them to be treated as an animal and then kicked back into society? Mm, yeah. Well, speaking of um, being treated like an animal or kicked back into society, a House Intelligence Panel on uh, Edward Snowden uh, they've been running a two-year investigation, and they've decided that uh, he is, in fact, a witch and that he should be burned. I mean, that he was no whistleblower, and uh, they have published summary findings and uh, believe that he should not have any sort of clemency whatsoever. Well, with a lot of people who do security analysis with the Snowden thing, um, he couldn't have gotten asylum uh, the way he did without spilling some sense of However, we need to know just the degree of abuse the NSA has been going on. Um, so that's appreciated, but th- this is a stickier wicket than everybody's making. There, there's yeah. so many shades of gray here. It, it, this is fine art. Now, they, they do actually, they have posted the summary findings in, in a PDF. I'm going to link that in the show notes as well. Uh, it is a 36-page report, which I have not yet read, because uh, I only found out about this uh, recently. Uh, 
Quoting, uh, most major congressional reports are rolled out with news conferences, floor speeches, and press releases. Not this one. There is only a three-page unclassified summary of the House Intelligence Committee's actual, oh, I'm sorry, it's only three pages, 36-page uh, report, which remains classified. Um, Devin Nunes, Republican out of California, the chairman of the panel. The report is based on facts, so it's all just facts that we gathered over a two-year process, and the report, I think, speaks for itself. Well... It's classified, so we can't really say. But there's uh, there's five points. Snowden caused tremendous damage to national security. Snowden is not a whistleblower, but a disgruntled employee. Uh, two weeks before he began the massive download of 1.5 million documents, Snowden had a workplace spat with NSA managers. Uh, Snowden is a serial exaggerator and fabricator who told a series of untrue stories about his health, education, and performance reviews. Uh, the committee says that it is concerned that the NSA and the intelligence community in general have not done enough to prevent another massive unauthorized disclosure of documents. Interesting. Well, and I don't think that I buy all that. No. Uh, there's a lot of people who got burned. Yeah. Um, and it is in a lot of self-interest in the eyes of a lot of political figures. Yeah, it's... Um, it is just a three-page report. Four pages. That's if what's you... released. Yeah. Um... Wow. Okay, so the bulk of the committee's 36-page review, which includes 230 footnotes, must remain classified to avoid causing further harm to national security. Yeah, well, of course. I... I appreciate that. I see that. I understand that. I also think that they're doing this to protect themselves, and I don't think it actually has a whole lot of bearing on reality. Because I've I've watched um, yeah. most of the the Snowden uh, press conferences and things like that that he's done. Uh, also, the interviews with Vice, which yeah. were in depth. He really doesn't strike me as the kind that is going to fly off the handle at a random spat with a coworker. No. You know, he, for me, the, the narrative as it was uh, initially disclosed uh, still fits the tale better than this. Um, but at the same time, I think that they, they had to do something, and they're going to cover their butts, period. He's not going to be allowed home. Uh, however, Julian Assange uh, did say that, no, that was about uh, Chelsea Manning, uh, that if Chelsea okay. Manning was released, that he would say that he would come and uh, and sit and basically swap and sit in the prison cell for her. Which is... I'll leave it when I see it. Interesting. Well, it's not going to happen anyway, but, you know, because we don't really do the whistleblower thing here. And uh, yes, Mama Van, you are only a whistleblower if you tell on another country. Or in a corporation. Yeah. But yeah, the government seems to be a bit off limits. You're not, not really allowed. And speaking of things you're not allowed to do, and uh, well, there might be some whistleblowers involved in this too, but cast out police officers are often hired in other cities. Uh, they were referred to as gypsy cops by some, some departments out there. Uh, so these would be folks that uh, that have done a bad. They've lost. They've lost the permissions in one county jurisdiction, what what have you, to be a cop. So they move somewhere else. And be a cop. And get a job as a cop. There's a problem with the background checks that are done. Uh, basically, they're really lack lux lack uh, luster and. It's up to the individual department. Yeah. There isn't any federal or even state-level oversight. Right. Uh, however, there is, uh, I found this interesting, last year in a report by President Obama's task force on 21st century policing, law enforcement officials and others recommended that the Justice Department establish a database in partnership with the International Association of Directors of Law Enforcement Standards. Jeez, that's a mouthful. And, and training. And training. 
Yeah, I wasn't even done. Which manages a database of officers who have been stripped of their police powers. There are some 21,000 names on the list right now. Um, But Mike Bicker, the uh, group's executive director, said his organization lacked the resources to do a thorough job. I'm not surprised, and that's probably true. Uh, He says it's all we can do just to keep the database up. (sighs) Not enough government funds going to a vital organization. Well, they're also, you're going to get the case where the people that are looking at it aren't going to ever admit that it's a vital thing. Uh, You know, because of that thin blue line, the blue wall. Hi, Sprocket. Don't want bad cops on force. Right, but at the same time, any time that you blow the whistle on another cop, your career's over. You're blackballed. That's been a historically true, but that's a historic thing. Because then you're your own co-workers don't trust you. You're going to tattle on them. Yeah. Because because obviously we go apple. obviously we go back to grade school about the whole thing. Yeah, so any any time that you hear the the refrain and we hear it a lot of you know the police need to police themselves or they they need to you know look out for their own bad apples and things like that. It's not that easy. Because there's a uh, schoolyard politics is, is heavily involved. Heavily involved. And these are schoolyard bullies in many cases that have guns. Yeah. There's, there, there is animosity. There, there is reciprocity that happens. And often it is uh, not on any lists or, or reports or anything like that. And uh, people, people's careers are ruined. You know, people that are fantastic cops, they're great at their job, they're, they're doing the right thing over and over and over, and they have a bright future. And then they, they do the right thing. And then they're persecuted by their own department. They're Fired. passed over for promotions. They are then blackballed for every other post that they want to go to, and they end up making tens of thousand dollars less than what they should, and they never make it to where they uh, they were before. It destroys their career. So it's either you turn a blind eye and keep going for your career, or you do the right thing, and you get penalized for it. It's it's very much a case of no good deed goes unpunished. This yeah. is why the Justice Department needs to do more. Yeah. So this is the case of, hey, Justice Department, do your job. Well, at least, uh, you know, we've been following, you know, pretty closely at this point. The Justice, Justice Department, DOJ, has ended up in every show notes for the last, like, two oh. months. Yeah, two months. <laughs> so they've been quite busy. Not sure what that really means, but hey, at least they're doing something. And, well, actually, I think maybe only two of the things were in, in bad connotation that we were discussing. Everything else was, hey, look at, look at they're doing a good. So maybe there's hope. Maybe there's hope. Hope maybe. springs eternal. From the Department of Justice, which is something I never thought I'd say. But it's interesting. So with that, I think that uh, we need to move on. Hi, O'Reilly Radio listeners. This is your host, Andy Cowan, calling my voicemail to make sure that it still works. Please consider calling us, 470-222-6759. Bye. And on to This Week in History. Uh, Some things were literally from this week, and some things were from further in the past. Uh, It was recently found, and I do mean recently found, the doomed second vessel from the Franklin expedition to the Arctic was found in the ice. Uh, So a more than 160-year-old 
Arctic mystery has come to resolution. The HMS Terror, a vessel from a doomed Royal Navy expedition to chart the unnavigated portion of the Northwest Passage, has been found. Uh, Aletta Brook, operations manager for the Arctic Research Foundation, said uh, on Sunday, a team from the Charitable Arctic Research Foundation uh, maneuvered a small remotely operated vehicle through a open hatch into the ship to capture stunning images that give insight into the life aboard the vessel close to 170 years ago. We have successfully entered the mess hall, worked our way through the few cabins, found food storage, plates, and one can on the shelves. Uh, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what's in the can. Uh, we spotted two bottle, two wine bottles. Oh, you know what? They're in the Arctic. I bet they're still good. <laughs> Uh, and empty shelving. Found a desk with open drawers and something in the back corner of a drawer. Uh, the flagship vessel of British Captain Sir John Franklin's 1845 expedition, the HMS Erebus, was found back in 2014. Uh, the HMS Terror was found just north of the HMS Erebus wreck uh, in Nunavut's Terror Bay. I imagine that it's named for the ship. Probably not the other way around. So that's that's cool. I love finding things that are, you know, lost. Especially big things. You remember when, when they found that found where the Titanic actually was resting? Yeah. That was that. huge news. Huge news. This is not as huge, but it's really cool. <laughs> it's fascinating. Because I mean it'll be it you would think it's incredibly well preserved. So we can mm -hmm. learn a lot about our, our, our own history from that time period. According to The Guardian, a researcher heard an Inuit man say about six years ago he saw a large piece of wood that looked like a mass sticking out of the ice near Terror Bay. He took pictures but lost the camera. <laughs> oh, he thought it was a bad omen, losing the camera. <laughs> so he didn't, want to, he didn't want to say anything about it. Hmm. But, you know, rumors... Rumor has it there might be something over there. This is this is an old story, you know. Oh yeah, it's over there. I, f I found something. And just tracing whatever lead they could. It's a neat story. So expect to see something probably on on a BBC, uh, you know, nature special anytime. That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, that would be very cool. Oh, and you had uh, you brought a couple in here. That was my only one. So go ahead, Dan. Uh. Today we actually have some sad news. Um, one of the mo more storied and significant playwrights of um, recent history, Edward Albee, has passed away. Uh, he was the playwright of uh, Zoo Story, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, American Dream. Mm. Um, somewhat prolific, nowhere near as like Tennessee Williams, but still a significant uh, figure in American theater. Died at the age of 88. Hmm. What did what? Uh, what was the cause of death? Uh, short illness. Most likely just age. Okay. Yeah. But no. Uh, Who is Sylvia and 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 Zoo Story are both ones that uh, are are done often. In fact. Um, Regularly during the Orlando Fringe, uh, there is usually a production of Zoo Story since it's a two-man show and it takes place on a park bench. It's very easy to produce, hmm. um, very emotive, a wonderful feature for two actors. Solid show. Park uh, bench, two actors. It's kind of a little like waiting for Godot. <laughs> much darker though. Hmm. Good and much, much darker. I actually, the first time I saw the production was uh, one of the actors was William Catt from back in the day. Greatest American Hero and uh, a couple, uh, Perry Mason. I Greatest remember. American Hero, that guy? Yeah. Oh. Uh, no, William Catt, I saw the production when I was still living down in West Palm. Uh, and they had a touring show. No, it was quite good. And hmm. no, the he, a lot of his, his work Still done professionally today. So, uh, 
Albie was not a fan of mankind, uh, the critic John Lara wrote in New The New Yorker in 2012. Uh, the friendships he stages are loose affiliations that serve mostly as a bulwark against meaninglessness. Ouch. Uh, critics can be awfully harsh of any artist, but yeah. Albie was a bit of an enigma. Um, it's like, un- he might not have been wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unlike Arthur Miller, who was a uh, fairly affable gentleman, mm-hmm. uh, Alby was very, very reserved. He, as most, enjoyed uh, the acc- accolades and being lauded, but he was rather reclusive, especially in his later years. Interesting. Uh he said in a, a 1991 Times interview, all of my plays are about people missing the boat, closing down too young, coming to the end of their lives with regret at things not done, as opposed to things done. I find most people spend too much time living as if they're never going to die. I think the critic might have been right. No, he, a lot of his subject matter was grim. Uh, while, yeah. like, uh, again, almost every American playwright, it, it's, it's a significant note, um has their particular obsessions. Mm-hmm. Um, August Wilson, uh, rightfully so, was about capturing the, the plight of the African American uh, in almost all of his plays. Um, all these, everything was very dark. Uh, Tennessee Williams, um, inappropriate sexualization and violence. Um, mm. That That's pretty much his obsession uh so all noted playwrights um i mean the only one that's not quite you know easily pigeonholed is arthur miller but even he is is somebody who grapples more with the darker themes of mankind as opposed to uh comedic or lighter fare uh our other major uh celebrated playwrights eugene o'neill which I mean, Iceman cometh, come on. Uh, or Long Day's Journey into Night, which uh, is right now playing on Broadway. Uh, very, very dark work. Hmm. He, was, uh, he was an orphaned uh, child. Uh, he was adopted into the Albi family. And apparently he did not have a uh, nourishing childhood, as I said. Uh, Mr. Albee would often recall an unnourishing childhood in which he felt like an interloper in their home. In a 2011 interview at, uh, at the arena stage in Washington with the director Molly Smith, he said that his mother had thrown away, thrown out his first play. He described it as a three-act sex farce, which he wrote at age 14. <laughs> I think they wanted somebody who would be a corporate thug of some sort, or perhaps a doctor or lawyer, or something respectable, he told the television interviewer Charlie Rose. They didn't want a writer on their hands. Good God, no. <laughs> Sounds like a very interesting character. No, he um, was. But his mark has definitely been left on us, and we can uh, continue to see it at fringe festivals all over. Because... Yeah, those plays are here to stay. For sure. This is an exceptionally long article in the New York Times on on him. But um, see, he was a a pillar yeah. of American theater, and it's the New York Times. It makes sense. Yeah. So it's um, it's rich, lots of quotations and some. Some good pictures of the man, and uh, yeah, it's a good read. So you can find a link to that in our show notes. And let's see, the last one here. Anniversary of vote to allow women ministers in the Episcopal Church. In 1976, the General Convention approved the ordination of women and of, yes, uh, to the priesthood. Yes, that happened in 1976. 19- yeah, 1976. Huh. Uh, ordinations began on January 1st, 77. Yep. Uh, similar r- resolutions had been narrowly defeated at the uh, 1970 and 73 general conventions. Uh, let's see. 
on July 29, 1974, three bishops claiming that obedience to the Spirit justified their action, ordained 11 women deacons to the priesthood. The ensuing controversy surrounded these irregular ordinations, highlighted divisions evident in the church over the issue. After the 76 vote, most dioceses accepted the ordination of women, and ordinations of women proceeded at a rapid rate. In 1997, General Convention uh, revised the canons to prevent any diocese from denying access to the ordination process or refusing to license a member of the clergy to officiate solely on the grounds of gender. Well, looks like the Episcopal Church uh, does evolve on some issues, and that's good. Slowly but surely. Well, that's religion for you. If they're going to make changes, it's going to be slow. Or it's going to be legally mandated. <laughs> <laughs> One or the other. One or the other. But that's very interesting. So, oh, you have an, I have another uh, another link here. Women's this is Ministries. Just, uh, yeah, the oh, Holy Orders okay. and the history of women within the Episcopal Church. And the Worldwide Anglican Communion. Oh, this is a valuable little resource here. Excellent, thank you. Um, huh. Oh boy, there's a lot of stuff in here. Okay, big history. Lots of stuff, good stuff, good stuff that you can find, again, in the show notes. Follow those rabbit trails, and you too will be entertained like falling into a Wikipedia well. <laughs> Just one thing after the other, over and over and over again. So we have a little bit of a logical fallacy this week. Found another uh, another site for uh, explaining these logical fallacies in our human thinking. And uh, this one, is, it's out on onegoodmove.org under fallacy. Uh, they have they have categories that they, um, they put these in. And in this one, the category is changing the subject. And this is anonymous authorities. The authority in question is not named. This is the type of appeal to authority uh, because when an authority is not named, it is impossible to confirm that the authority is an expert. However, the fallacy is so common, it deserves special mention. A variation of this fallacy is the appeal to rumor. Because the source of the rumor is typically not known, it is not possible to determine whether to believe the rumor or not. Uh, very often, false and harmful rumors are deliberately started in order to discredit an opponent. Um, I found this uh, rather poignant, given the whole birther controversy this week with, um, with Donald Trump basically creating his own press conference to just kind of rickroll the entire public about the whole thing. Uh, and didn't he try to blame Hillary for it? No, it, it's been spun so many different directions, I, I, can't, even, I can't even follow it. I, I don't even know what's happened at this point. So I'll wait maybe maybe next week. There'll be kind of an, an itemized list of how things in chronological order. It's like, well, he said this, and then he said this, and then somebody else that he works for said this, and then, you know, on and on and on. So at the end of the day, basically, no, Obama's actually a citizen. He No problems. He's, he's cool. Bye. And that was it. That was like the press conference that he had. Very, very strange. Anyway, so that's an example of that, but also a, like a real world this week today kind of example. But the example for the um, for the um, the website was a government official said today that the new gun law will be proposed tomorrow. Experts agree that the best way to prevent nuclear war is to prepare for it. Uh, it is held that there are more than two million needless operations conducted every year. Rumor has it that the prime minister will declare another holiday in October. Uh, so as, as a proof, uh, argue that because we don't know the source of the information, we have no way to evaluate the reliability of the information. So all of those are appeals to authority. And it's a vagary. It's such a vagary. It's like, cite your sources, please. I've heard this. From who? Who are they? Is it useful? So... And that is that. In fact, that's it for show one. Or show A. In fact, I've got too many things playing. This is odd. Stop that one. There we go. 
<laughs> oh, we'll get it figured out eventually, right? One one of these days. One of these days. So, <clears throat> that's it for this show. We'll be back live. Uh, ah. But we'll be back live uh, next Friday, so you can join Fun and All the Chat Room all from our webpage uh, next Friday about 9.30 p.m. Eastern. I've redone the script, so it's a little awkward, so bear with me. <laughs> the second half of the show will drop Wednesday for those listening to the podcast. In the meantime, head over to O'ReillyRadio.com. That's O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O.com for all the links right at the top of the page for all that we do. Uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Tumblr, subscribe to the YouTube and Twitch channels so you never miss us. If you're hearing this right now, then you must like us. If you do, then others may like us as well. So you can do us a favor and share the show and review it on iTunes. Now, if you really love us, you can contribute to the Patreon and get early access to the midweek show releases and even get some special perks. Just follow the Patreon link on the webpage, and it'll take you over to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Radio. You can also make a one-time donation via the donate button. Please, please do. It'd be wonderful. We're always looking for new ideas for the show, so how about you share what's on your mind and shoot us a note to a really radio podcast at gmail.com, or if you're the more talkative sort, 470-222-ORLY-6759, uh, and is always ready to take your call or text. We can't thank you enough for spending some time with us. Until next time, this has been O'Reilly Radio, part of the Cowan Services Network. Music for the show is created by the inevitable Kevin McLeod of Incomtech.com. And that concludes this show. If you are with us, then we'll see you in about 10 minutes. Otherwise, we'll talk to you on Wednesday. Bye, everyone.